the staging for UTUC has been very challenging traditionally. Um, even with the uh, the more modern um, technologies that we have at our disposal for um, you know an endoscopic access of upper tracts. It's still very difficult because of the anatomical exclusion of these tumors and the circuitous routes through which we have to take in order to access these tumors um, and the small size of the instruments that we use. Um, it's impossible for us to completely stage the tumor because, um, you know, akin to urothelial cancer of the bladder, upper tract disease is staged according to the depth of invasion into the urothelium of the upper tract and beyond. And so it's impossible for us to resect those tumors in the upper tract the way that we do for bladder cancer, for instance, because of the, the difficulty of access. And so oftentimes, especially for high-grade disease, we really don't understand how deep the invasion is. Um, so as you would imagine, a, a patient with high-grade TA disease oftentimes is treated the same way as a patient with um, what, what would be equivalent of a high-grade T3 disease in the bladder. Um, so because of the inadequacy of the staging, it makes um, you know patient selection for neoadjuvant chemotherapy very difficult. Uh, and oftentimes we rely on things like cross-sectional imaging, which is also very imperfect in picking up disease that may be extending beyond the urothelium of the upper tract and you know, sometimes also the kidney itself. Um, so the current standard of care really is anybody with high-grade disease should be considered for neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, because the evidence that's extrapolated from bladder cancer where Patients may benefit from chemotherapy given in the neoadjuvant setting. Uh, but as you would imagine, not knowing if a patient has superficial high grade disease versus invasive high grade disease, there is certainly a large number of patients who are over treated by that strategy. So, um, the purpose of our study really is to see whether we can use the CTDNA platform to help refine the staging of upper tract disease to better select for patients with neological chemo. Circulating tumor DNA has been um, sort of um, emerging in the forefront of cancer care within the last couple of years. What these are is really uh, DNA that's devoid of cells, so cell-free DNA, um, that can be detected within any liquid compartment within the body, whether it be in the plasma or urine or saliva or any other bodily fluid compartment. And what these cell-free DNA come from are cells that either go through apoptosis or any other type of cell turnover, and through that, release uh, DNA that's associated with the cell. So, um, what we can do nowadays is through next generation sequencing platforms, be able to use tumor specific DNA to detect the cell free DNA that may be derived from tumor cell turnover specifically to understand whether there is any presence of tumor cells at the time of the testing. And so we essentially leverage this platform to try to understand whether or not we can use the detection of, uh, of cancer-related cell-free DNA in the upper tract urothelial cancer patients um, to understand whether they have invasive disease or not. We um, consented 30 patients with high-risk UTUC uh, based on their endoscopic um, diagnosis, as well as their cross-sectional imaging, who are undergoing upfront surgery, extirpative surgery, to either remove the kidney along with the ureter, or just the segment of the ureter itself um, and connecting the rest of the ureter tract. And uh, from these patients, um, prior to surgery, we took their plasma samples and 
use the Predison Care platform, which is a targeted uh, NGS panel looking at 150 genes of uh, interest that cover a lot of um, the commonly discovered gene mutations that are found within upper tract disease. And uh, to see whether or not, number one, we can detect these gene alterations in the preoperative setting. And number two, you know, also to use the tissue samples that we harvest from the extirpative surgery to understand whether there is any concordance between the, the ctDNA that we're detecting within the plasma and also the tissue samples. And so um, 30 patients were consented to the surgery. And, and again, they haven't had any neological treatment at all. And this is, you know, according to standard of care. Out of those 30 patients, 14 had either muscle invasive uh, upper tract urothelial cancer or non-invasive cancer, but with associated lymph node metastasis. So uh, invasive disease. And out of the 30 patients, we're able to detect at least one gene alteration in 21 patients. So a good number of them did have plasma gene alterations that were detected. When comparing the plasma cpDNA versus the whole exome sequencing of the tissue samples that we harvested at the time of the surgery, we found that there was a 52% concordance between the plasma cpDNA and the tissue. And based off of all of this information and on previous studies using other bespoke um, cpDNA platforms, we decided on uh, the threshold of having at least two or more ctDNA alterations being a positive test. And we added to this also a copy number change that we derived from a low-pass whole genome sequencing um, test that was done concurrently as this targeted uh, panel. And with the two together, we're able to predict with 79% sensitivity and 94% specificity those patients that have either muscle invasive or non-organ confined DTUC. That's a very exciting finding from our study as well, is that uh, no matter what the adjuvant or the salvage treatment some of these patients may have after surgery, uh, we did find that the cpDNA that was detected prior to surgery, independent of their staging at the time of the surgery, uh, was able to prognosticate whether or not they were, they'll have a long disease-free survival or not. Um, so that just goes to speak for the cpDNA's ability to prognosticate in general, um, to tell apart uh, the patients that have a heavy disease burden systemically uh, versus those that don't. Um, and, you know, going forward, obviously, the patients with a positive cpDNA test prior to surgery are probably those that should undergo neoadjuvant treatment um, as much as possible to eliminate the micrometastatic disease that they most likely harbor. Um, but, you know, also the one thing that we didn't look for in this study per se is the, the kinetics of the cpDNA from prior to surgery to afterwards. Um, to understand whether or not the surgery actually played a major role in clearing out the cancer or not. And that's going to be our next step. So one thing that I would like to add is, um, you know, the sensitivity and the specificity that were, uh, we found on this study was much better than those that are found from clinical normal groups. So, you know, one thing that I, I should have, you know, spoke to in the beginning of the talk was um, currently because of the, the shortfall in the staging and the imaging that we have for high-risk UTUC, um, there's a number of group that, that has looked at clinical nomograms. So conglomerating a lot of the clinical risk factors, such as hydronephrosis that are seen on the CT scan, positive urine cytology, the size of the tumor, any perinephric stranding, things like that that you can derive from the clinical picture to understand how likely it is for patients to have muscle invasive disease. 
And for those clinical nomograms, the sensitivity or the ability to pick up on the muscle invasive disease is in the 40 to 50% range. And I would point out that the sensitivity in this case is probably the more important because in upper tract disease patients, you don't want to miss out on the opportunity to give them neologic chemotherapy because oftentimes, you know, um, as a result of the surgery, they'll have surgical renal function impairment such that they cannot receive chemotherapy in the adjuvant set for, for a lot of the patients. So the sensitivity of the test, the ability to pick up those patients with muscle invasive disease up front, to me, is um, a very important aspect of our test um, to help give those patients who need neological chemotherapy the therapy that they would actually need to extend their lives.